So a little personal story. Five years ago, after I had participated in my first Judson worship service and had had a very brief but very, very loud encounter with the Judson sound system, Donna emailed her own report card evaluation to the staff, and at the very bottom of the report was the sentence, Micah speaking into the microphone will be a continual concern. <laughs> but here I am, five years later, I took that as a challenge as one should take most things Donna says. And here I am, celebrating a woman who has nearly literally given me my own wings, clipped them a little bit more than once, and continues to do all the things they sing about in mid-career Bette Midler ballads. <laughs> and I can see from all of your faces that Donna does that for so many people. So I decided to find out the recipe. I decided to figure out the science of how she does it, the science of how Donna creates what I call a culture of invitation that she so effortlessly promotes. How does she maintain such a balance of attachment and non-attachment? How does she help all of us to do the same? Now, I find that we're going to figure this all out as we hear the toast that I'm kicking off, but for myself, I'm gonna go back to my first ever meeting with her a little over five years ago at a little vegan restaurant called Red Bamboo on West 4th Street where I realized she had revealed a secret to me. And it has a food metaphor, so it will curb that hunger as well. So without us even knowing one another, I sat in front of her. I was so nervous, as I assume many people are when they first meet Donna for one of those meetings. So picture it. A New York City vegan restaurant. A nervous, verbose, spiky-haired pre-seminarian with an idea. And a wise, stylish, humbly attractive woman holding a stack of random pieces of cardboard and newsprint. It's a classic meet-cute New York love story. <laughs> Donna's sitting quietly across from me, shuffling bits of paper, mail, and such. Donna lets me blather on quite nervously. Donna doesn't interrupt that much. Donna barely looks up from her calendar. She just nods and sips her jasmine tea. Then when she can't take my ramblings anymore, this is what she calmly says to me. Well, basically, Micah. I take an idea, I throw it in a pot, I stir it real good, and then when it's hot, I take the idea, I throw it at the wall, I pray that it sticks, and that's what I call spaghetti ministry. Spaghetti ministry, spaghetti ministry, spaghetti ministry, spaghetti ministry, spaghetti ministry, spaghetti ministry, spaghetti ministry. Oh, won't you sing with me? Spaghetti ministry, 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 spaghetti ministry. Beautiful. Okay, verse two. Donna doesn't know where we will find the cash. But I get a job that very day. True story. Donna doesn't know if I will burn or crash. The jury's still out. But Donna doesn't mind much either way. Donna's schooling might seem random, rushed, and strange. She's a one-woman seminary. Good ideas just grow, and bad ideas just change. So keep perfecting Donna's recipe. And sing with me. 
Spaghetti ministry, 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 spaghetti ministry. Okay. Go take an idea and throw it in a pot and stir it real good. And then when it's hot, go take the idea and throw it at the wall and pray that it sticks. And that's what you call spaghetti ministry. Do it, spaghetti ministry, 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 Donna! That's the end! Good work! Yeah! D Scops! Who needs food? All right, to further curb your hunger for toasts and roasts, please welcome from Amherst, Mary Hockett. Well, first of all, you have to pronounce Amherst correctly. Right. I guess you always drop the H. Okay. okay. Thank you. How to follow that is uh, almost impossible. Yeah, the mic. I'm not Amherst. Here. Thank you. Right. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I met Donna in 1980, and uh, I was on the search committee for our church, and she was the first woman clergy in the town. And believe me, she has left a mark, a big mark there, and I'm forever grateful. She came with her basket. Have you ever seen her basket? Okay. A basket filled with stuff, and I never did find out what stuff was in there, but it made an impression on me. And she was also extremely busy. Once at the church I now go to, I've left the UCC, I now go to Episcopalian, I've gone up. And um, so, <laughs> only because of a love interest. Okay. <laughs> that, I guess, Maybe Jesus, I don't know. Anyway, um, so um, I, uh, the basket was filled with stuff, which sort of is a bit like Donna and her m many ideas. But before I get into that, I just want to say she is a woman who, I've got a whole long list here, and you could probably add 10 more, and it'll be very boring, but I'm gonna, very, I'm gonna go very fast. All right, she's pastor, preacher, activist, teacher, friend, mother, wife, grandmother, visionary, advocate, cook, gardener, color designer, and she loves old and beautiful objects, and she's a hell of a lot of fun. And there are many, many more things. So one day at Grace Church, a woman called Annie um, decided she was working far too hard, and so she tried to establish a support group for workaholics. And they met, and I just talked to her today, and she affirmed that there were indeed five people, four men, one woman, Annie. And um, they had a very good conversation, mostly about the good things, about working too hard. Um, and the men were pretty defensive about the things that were not so good about working too hard. Donna works too hard. Oh, yes, the end of that story is then they looked at their diaries and tried to find out when they were going to meet next, and they could not come up with a time. <laughs> end of that support group. Um, Donna, however, does work sometimes too hard, but she always finds a balance somehow. And I'm forever grateful for that. So the basket, the basket reminded me, you know Donna is a very good gardener, even though she did not get into Coral Gables. Well, Coral Gables Garden Club, and I don't know, I, that rung a bell because I have never even been invited to Amherst Garden Club, um, and I have a pretty good garden, um, but <laughs> there were garden clubs and garden clubs. We have our own. And uh, so it reminded me, this basket, of compost. You know, you put all sorts of stuff in compost, eggshells and the rinds and even bones some people put in and so on. And it perks and perks and the worms come and join it and it becomes pure gold for those gardens. And that is what Donna is, pure 
gold. And I give to Donna, she's queen for a day today, so she's got um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee um, little mat here, little mat, because I thought she needed that, and um, just to remind her of ancient heritage, and, um, and a cross from Ethiopia that uh, priests bless anybody they happen to meet on the streets. So now you will have a cross presented, maybe sometimes, when you see her on the street. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Hawkins from Amherst. And now, from New Sanctuary Movement, please welcome Ravi Ragbir. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, you know, I was asked to do a roast of Donna. The problem is I couldn't think of any stories. Um, so then they told me, no, they're going to change it, and it's going to be a toast. So which is, I'm happy to do that, and I'm, I'm glad I'm here. But before I do, um, I just want to say, preface my, my talk here, that any, any names or any characters who, are, who you heard of today are all fictional, and it doesn't apply to anyone. <laughs> so one of the stories that I do have to say, Donna wasn't even involved in it. Um, you know, we have a new... Uh, senior, manage, senior administrator in the office here. And, you know, she's new and she's learning the ropes and she's understanding what is happening. And what, we were having a meeting in Donna's office and I asked to borrow the key to open the door. And she looked up at me and I went to, to, to the senior administrator. I said, can I get the key and I will open the door. And she looked at me and she said, is that allowed? And there were four of us, apart from me, there were four other staff around me, and everyone looked at each other and said, in, simultaneously, yes. And, you know, in, when we, so she didn't hand me the key, she said, um, you know, I will walk you, I'll take the key and I'll open the door for you. you know, she's a senior minister, you know, so uh, we have to observe protocol. Um, but that's the problem, right? because Donna it doesn't observe protocol. Right? <laughs> Donna opens up the doors, and we know Donna to be, you know, when she shares, she shares everything with you. Imagine when she invites you for dinner, and you, yeah, great, sure, we'd love to come to dinner, and then she sends an email, so what are you cooking? <laughs> uh, and that is, you know, for someone who, when I'm in the kitchen, I can't have people with me because I move really fast and I bump into my wife and she gets upset with me. So for me, a kitchen is a safe, sp a sacred space. And when Donna said that, I was a little taken aback. But that's what Don that's who Donna is. Donna, when she invites you, you're her family, you're a friend. You you're not just a friend, you're family. And she opens up everything for you. She shares that space that is sacred. And she, exp she said, this is yours. So if you want to open my covers and use whatever is in here, you, you're more than welcome to do that. How much of us here have understood that and have experienced that from Donna? Right? And that's why we love you, Donna. But, you know, I do have one story to tell. And... One of the stories, uh, she taught me a lot. She has actually taught me how to decipher code. And I'm looking around here, and I know some people understand what I mean, because she would write a sentence, and you expect to learn, know what exactly she's talking about uh, with a few words, uh, what, what you have to do, how you have to do it, and when you have to get it done in one line. And we had a team of decoders, you know, the imitation game, we had a team of decoders that you would come run to each other. Hey, what did Donna mean by this? What, do you, what is she saying here? Can you tell me? I mean, maybe she talked to you about it. But it is all because Donna has, has, has involved in so many, so many movements, so many justice, that she assumes you are on the same mindset because you have been there with her. And she is there with you. And so she expects you and knows that you will pick it up very soon. So I, you know, Donna, um, 
I am a, I'm a little surprised. I, I was going to say the word disappointed, but I will, I'm a little surprised because when I found out that this was your 40th year of ordination, uh, what surprised me is that you didn't have 40 books with you. <laughs> and I was taken aback and trying to figure out what you need to catch up. Oh, that's it. She started late because of influences, male influences and, and, and other people who are dis distracted you. But, you know, when you look at what you can write about, you know, I would say you can write about all the places that you have worked in, all those churches you have worked in. And that, but that's only like six. All the states you have worked in, that's six more. I wouldn't suggest you write about the people you have touched because that's too much. That's thousands, right? And that's a lot. So yeah, yeah, I don't expect you to put all of this in, in 10 books. You will have multiple books that you can write about. Um, and that's how I, that's what I, I know about Donna. And you know, you have asked, you want to ask me whether I put you on a pedestal. And you know, I said no, but you know, you know that's not true. I do put you on a pedestal because you have done and you are such a great person that I have no choice to do that. And I, I, I was a little, I felt undeserved to be here to speak about Donna because of who you are. But then I also have to say I'm honored to speak about Donna and to give a toast about Donna and to give a toast to Donna. So here's my toast. My toast is, um, we don't have, we, if you, are, you don't have to raise the glasses yet, not yet, I'll tell you when. But I toast to you 40 years of in the ordination, 40 years of preaching, 40 years of speaking to a congregation, 40 years of radicalizing congregation, 40 years of creating churches, 40 years of taking those churches out of the walls. 40 years of justice movement, 40 years of fighting and struggling for justice, 40 years for the people. And this is where I would ask you to raise your glasses if you have one. 40 years of leading the people in the, who are in the wilderness to the promised land. And understanding that the promised land is not what we're looking for, but each, uh, each other, the place that you have created the space and the love that you have created, the sharing and the caring for each other, and the fight that we fight together for each other. That is the promised land, and I toast to you, Donna. So I know that my mom has spent a lot of time uh, in front, right standing right here mostly, um, telling a lot of lies about both Jacob and myself, and I'm here to tell you that they're all not true, right? Um, so. You know, it's been really powerful to hear all of the things that people have said about my mom, but I think that there, there's something that has been missing that I wanted to bring out uh, to talk about. And the thing is, is that I think that hasn't been said yet is that my mom is an organizer, right? Um, and she is an organizer, and she became an organizer because she had to become an organizer. Because in her life, she experienced injustice and had to organize to get power to get the things that she needed. So her first organizing campaign was to make sure that her high school didn't close in West Virginia so she could graduate, so she could go to college. She had to organize to change the UCC so she could be a part of it, right? So it had an expansive vision of women leadership and women being able to be a part of it so she could live her life. And I think part of the reason that she's such an amazing organizer is that she understands power and she also doesn't care at all about authority, right? She doesn't believe in it. She does not believe in the authority of the state or the authority of societal norms. Has everybody here experienced that? We certainly have as, as her children. Right. And so I think that that's a really amazing thing, that she does not experience that kind of authority because she gets authority from someplace else, which is God. She's actually had the experience of going to the top of mountains in Arizona and God speaking to her 
to say that you should be doing this work. When I talked to her yesterday, uh, I was like, how are you feeling about the party? She said, oh, completely insufferable. She was so happy that this was happening, and she said, who, who can believe that I could do anything for 40 years? <laughs> and the thing that we decided was only this, right? Only this work is something that she could do for 40 years. And I think all of us have been blessed with the fact that she does not care about authority in the slightest. And the only authority that she cares from comes from God and her spiritual path. Um, I think that we'll, we'll spend some time talking uh, within all of our tables and sort of the, the past few... Sorry, I think that many of the conversations that, that have happened over the past few days um, center kind of around that theme of um, my mom either not respecting authority, creating her own authority, or um, doing things that are in her way. Um, and I think Barbara mentioned it earlier uh, at the panel that, oh, that's just the way Donna does it. Um, and while that is lovely when you work with her, it can oftentimes be embarrassing as a child. Um, and we'll spend more time on that later if you'd like some stories. Um, but I think most importantly, one of the things that is uh, very interesting for us to hear about and is kind of remarkable and one of the biggest lessons I've taken from my mom um, has to do with some of the paradoxes um, that we see in, in my mom, right? The fact that she's able to do this one job for 40 years when her attention span lasts about 90 seconds. <laughs> All right? Um, the fact that we are Katie, Jacob, and Isaac Goldstein, and we're preacher's kids. <laughs> um, the fact that my mom has not missed a deadline on a writing assignment, but I don't think she's ever been on time meeting me and a group of people for dinner. <laughs> um, the, the, these go on and on and on. Um, and I think these are embodied in uh, things with us, and it's really fun to hear those stories embodied with the rest of you as well. Um, for example, for myself, um, my mom pushed me to play ultimate frisbee, not a sport people consider seriously, but play it as seriously as you possibly can. <laughs> and that's been absolutely lovely and really, really fun for me and rewarding. Um, earlier today um, in the, the panels, um, my mom mentioned what she thinks my brother's favorite t-shirt should be, <laughs> right? Which is minister mother, rabbi wife, get over it. And I think that one of the things that's been helpful for me and really fun about how my mom tackles these paradoxes is say, oh, that's nice, <laughs> get over it. It just doesn't matter. And so from that place, being able to just move forward and do stuff, right? And I feel like that's something that we've seen in many of the other speakers. Um, and whatever that stuff is, it's about your own strength or whatnot, but it's getting over some of those paradoxes and just saying, great, get over with it, go forward, have fun with that. So it's lovely to see that in all of you, and thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Katie and Jacob. And now we heard about spaghetti ministry earlier, and there is no better way that we witness spaghetti ministry than through Donna's community ministry program. So here, as a representative of the community ministers, is Jeff Mansfield. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Mansfield. I'm the associate pastor at First Church Somerville in Somerville, Massachusetts, formerly of the Community Ministry Program, an alum of the Community Ministry Program, and I have been asked to roast and toast Donna on behalf of the community ministers. In order to do that, I need you, I know you're chewing, and I know we had to wait for food, but I need you to repeat after me. Can you do that for me? I'll give you a minute to swallow. You've had plenty of time. You know it's coming. Can you say... Yes. yes. Can you say yes? yes? Can you say it like a sweaty, mad person, wild yes? yes? Now here's the, the difficult part, the embarrassing part, the worrying part for all of you. Do you have any idea what I have asked you to say yes to here tonight? No, you don't. That's embarrassing for you. That's a little bit dangerous 
for you. Do you have any idea really who I am? Do you have any idea really what it is that I am capable of asking you to do? <laughs> Some of you do. Let's not tell those stories tonight. Well, if you are a community minister, or maybe if you're any person here, you've had that moment where Donna Scopper said yes to you. And if you're in the community ministry program, or if you're an alum of the community ministry program like I am, I am sure that you had that experience where Donna said yes to you, not really knowing who you were. You hadn't earned it yet. You didn't deserve that yes yet, but you needed that yes. I needed that yes, and Donna was the one who gave that yes to us to let us do that. And she said yes to us over and over and over, and everything that she and all of Judson and all the good people of Judson allowed us